Welcome to Industry Focus, a podcast that dives into a different sector of the stock market every day. It's Tuesday, April 3rd, and I'm your host, Vincent Chen. I've just returned from sunny Austin, Texas, and I'm happy to be back in the studio with you fools. Today, we're going to turn our attention to consumer and retail IPO activity again in 2018, this time with the approximately $6 billion security specialist, ADT. Joining me via Skype is senior Motley Fool contributor, Asit Sharma. Thanks for hopping on today. Thanks a lot, Vince, for having me. And it's good to be with you guys again. So I'm not sure, I said, if you have any personal experience with the company, but my parents actually had ADT installed at our home growing up. And I'll, I'll never forget setting the alarm off by accident when I was a kid. So I fat fingered the code a few times after the alarm went off and the police ended up showing at my front door. So I think I was maybe <laughs> seven or eight years old at the time. So it was a bit of a disaster because I think that was right around when my parents had just started to trust that I could stay at home by myself. So that probably, I think that, uh, put a, a little bit of a kink in terms of my plans for that. But I have had some personal experience with ADT. I didn't realize the company was quite as big as it is until, um, we started doing our research for the show. But this company, uh, recently went public for a second time through so its initial public offering uh ticker is ADT easy enough to remember they serve 7.2 million residential and commercial customers with security and monitoring services so that makes it uh, one of the leaders in this space absolutely so ADT actually priced its IPO on January 18th but from the start the company has been running into some speed bumps so the IPO itself was originally slated to price between 17 and 19 dollars per share but it ultimately came in under the range at just $14, raising $1.5 billion. So, at pricing, ADT had a market capitalization of $10.5 billion. Um, but the key word there is that it had a market cap of around $10.5 billion. So, even though the IPO priced below the range in its two and a half months on the market, the stock has declined further to less than $8 per share. And that's basically cut the market cap in half to less than $6 billion. So, we'll get more into the details and drivers behind some of that uh, bearish public reception. But first, um, some background for the company itself. So, Asa, can you give listeners an overview of this company, of this business? Sure. Uh, and I have to put in one pun, really bad pun, before I begin. <laughs> when I was listening to you, Vince, talk about how the stock had declined price below expected range and, and descended on down. No reason to be alarmed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, we bad. had ADT to um, for a while, so certainly have. I think many of our listeners should have some experience with this company. Um, anyway, this is in the monitored home security industry. ADT, of course, is a giant uh, in this field. It has two pr primary brands: its namesake brand ADT and Protection One. So, as been said, uh, it serves residential and commercial customers, about 7.2 million customers. And it does this through two direct, uh, two channels, the direct channel sales and um, indirect channel sales. Direct channel sales has a sales force of about 2,900 sales consultants. And in its indirect channel, it uses about 300 um, dealers throughout the US and Canada. These are ADT authorized dealers. Uh, outside of that, it has 4,600 installation and monitoring technicians. And these people are based out of 200 sales and service centers in the U.S. and Canada. So, uh, one thing we all know, of those of us who have had any kind of security service, it's labor-intensive to install and sometimes to maintain. Now, it has a lot of its recurring revenue through monitoring centers. That's when you get an alarm or you have uh, maybe a kid like Vince who hears the alarm. Yep. And you got to call into a, a monitoring center. So it has 12 of these in North America, and these are staffed with an additional 4,200 uh, customer service reps. Yeah, I mean, this Something is interesting about ADT, which uh, I found out doing the research for the show, is it's not a manufacturer. It's just a distributor. It purchases equipment from uh, third-party suppliers and distributors, and then it installs this equipment in your home and uh, maintains it when it needs to. As for competition, you've probably heard of some of, some of these names uh, read through their... Uh, annual report uh, preparing for the show, Vivint Incorporated, uh, Stanley Security Systems, which is a subsidiary of Stanley Black & Decker, um, Comcast Corporation, and also companies like AT&T uh, are also edging into the 
uh, business. And some of you are probably familiar with Ring Security, which we will probably talk about later in this show. And that's just been acquired by Amazon. So it's a raft of uh, competition. Thanks, Asset. So something else to keep in mind too is uh, this recent IPO um, is a deal that came about after the company was taken private in 2016. Um, so the New York Times has a quick summary of how ADT came to be from an article in 2016 uh, that I thought was interesting. So uh, I'll quote that here. It said. ADT traces its roots to Edward A. Callahan, the man who invented the stock ticker in 1867, when Mr. Callahan, the president of Callahan's gold and stock telegraph company, found a burglar in his home. He created a telegraph-based alert system. After more than a century of acquisitions and antitrust rulings, ADT was acquired by Tyco in 1997. Tyco decided to be broken up into three units in 2012, making ADT once again an independent company. Then after that, they were taken private by Apollo, and then two years later, Another IPO, which leaves us here. So that uh, deal in 2016 was a leveraged buyout, something that we talked about last week um, in terms of the retail space. And the Apollo deal was actually valued at about $6.9 billion. So two years and a string of acquisitions and mergers later, ADT is currently playing catch up still, kind of in terms of the recent trading. Um, but going back to some of the business focused. Uh, Aspects of this company. Uh, some of the things you mentioned, like the customer contracts. I think it's interesting to note that uh, the typical customer contract has a three year term for residential customers, about a five year term for commercial ones. And the big thing here is uh, after a customer pays an upfront, upfront fee, they also make those monthly payments um, for the remainder of the contract. So, uh, coupled with uh, automatic contract renewals, um, as you mentioned, Asa, this business model generates a relatively stable recurring source of revenue. I think something like 90% of the top line comes from those recurring monthly payments. Um, but the flip side of the equation is that onboarding new customers requires uh, installation and other costs that the company has to bear up front as well. And ADT generally, believe I believe, needs about three years to break even on that initial investment in a new customer. So, uh, these longer-term contracts are definitely very important, but also retaining those customers is very important. And in the company's 10K, uh, you know, ADT names some of those big competitors that you mentioned. Um, and in addition to that, there's a lot of new small companies that are entering the space. So as a result, um, if you browse the company's press releases and their announcements in their investor relations page, you'll see that management is, uh, they're announcing a lot of collaborations with other companies that, for example, contract for its monitoring solutions, or they're working to integrate a lot of smart home features from big tech names, even like Amazon and Samsung. So, the company has definitely changed quite a bit in the past few years. And again, there's a lot of deals uh, and acquisitions in that time, uh, not only for Protection One and ASG that were really critical to the formation of ADT as it currently stands. But in 2017 alone, I think there were another four or five additional smaller deals. Um, many of those were intended to, bol uh, to bolster their commercial offerings. And those were followed by two more deals in just the first few months of 2018. So coming up, we're going to take a closer look at some of the numbers behind this business and what kind of threats and opportunities the Internet of Things and other consumer product innovations pose for the company's outlook. All right, so ADT released its earnings for full year 2017 not too long ago. They saw annual revenue come in at about $4.3 billion. Um, at this scale, um, you have to think slow and steady when it comes to growth for this company. Uh, estimates put top line growth in the low single digits going forward for the next few years. Um, but I said, how about some of the other metrics that stood out to you? Um, I think during the recent call, for example, things like uh, attrition, debt seemed to be areas of focus. What caught your eye? Sure. The attrition uh, caught my eye, uh, first off, in this business, uh, again, if you've owned a system, after some time, you get competing offers or you decide that you really don't need so much uh, of this home security aspect. So they tend to see a pretty uh, interesting customer attrition rate. Uh, historically, it's been around 16%. One of the positives that the company points out, uh, since leading up to its IPO and since then, is that it's brought that attrition rate down to below 14%. I think as of fourth quarter, it's at 13.7%. Mm -hmm. And just to translate what that might mean uh, to the company in terms of dollars, 
that every 100 basis points, or let's say one percentage point that they can reduce that attrition rate, that saves them $100 million that they would otherwise have to spend uh, to offset a loss in revenue. So that number is very important for uh, ADT. But I want to walk backward from uh, to, to another number which uh, really caught my eye in terms of long-term investors, how you look at a company's balance sheet and its prospects. We often talk about uh, margins and revenue. Let's work backward today from the balance sheet um, of this company. I'm going to go into a little bit, a short bit of history um, on why this IPO needed to happen, then talk about the company's debt burden. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons, or maybe the primary reason that ADT went public again is uh, Apollo management decided that they wanted to keep control of the company while offloading a little bit of the debt. Uh, Vince, you and I were talking before the show, the company has let's say roughly $11 billion in debt. We know that through this IPO, they're going to reduce that by uh, a little bit, about 15% of that overall debt. The main burden that um, ADT wanted to get rid of was $750 million worth of preferred securities, which they owed to Coke Industries. And uh, these preferred shares, if you were the lender, they're great because you have priority over common stockholders, and you often get a really sweet dividend. So, they were on the hook in terms of interest expense for 9% on the $750 million. So, with the proceeds that Vince mentioned, about $1.42 billion of proceeds, uh, the companies put $750 million in escrow to get rid of this obligation, which has this 9% burden on it. It used another $649 million uh, to redeem some other debt that was also high interest. And that left the company with $16 million to pay uh, a little bit of fees from the IPO. So, all the proceeds really went to reducing debt. The problem that ADT has is not really leverage, however. We talk a lot on the show about companies uh, which come to market with high debt burdens. In fact, um, listeners may remember just a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Hudson uh, having sort of a large debt burden that it needed to reduce over time. ADT has that. It's not that much of a problem in terms of the size of the debt. They're leveraged about four uh, times their EBITDA, uh, earnings before interest, uh, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Not a really high number. They want to move to three times uh, that. The problem is they still have a lot of debt that's high interest. There are about $3.1 billion of senior notes, which carry, again, an interest rate of 9%. That is a huge uh, interest burden. And in fact, Wall Street was surprised. The company had its IPO in January. Wall Street was surprised last month, in the middle of March, when ADT had its first earnings report. Uh, the analysts were not expecting a loss, but that's just what happened. The net income on the books looked pretty great. Uh, it was, I think, um, uh, 600 and, and some odd million. But after you took out the uh, tax benefit that the company received. And we've seen a lot of companies, due to the recent tax legislation, get a big uh, tax benefit. Once you remove that, ADT swung to a small loss. And the same thing happened uh, during the year. If you look at the whole year, $343 million in net income reverts to a loss of $422 million when you factor in uh, the debt that's there and you take away a $764 million uh, tax benefit. So, just to summarize everything I'm saying, if you take away those one-time gifts from the federal government, ADT actually operates at an annual loss. It did it in 2016, and it uh, has done it again in 2017. And, and I actually, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts, Vince. I'm not sure that it will be able to swing to a profit anytime soon. Yeah, I think uh, that was definitely a big surprise, as you mentioned, uh, with the earnings release a couple weeks ago now. And it's... Kind of a surprising, it's surprising to me because uh, I think it probably has to do with those high in upfront installation costs that the company has to bear. But usually, uh, more so on the tech side, but sometimes in our consumer and retail space too, we look at these companies where uh, they are able to generate this kind of subscription, uh, monthly recurring kind of revenue. You compare it to like a Netflix, for example, and some, uh, uh, and some of the positives of that. Cause as you scale, you see a lot of benefits in terms of your profitability and things along those lines. I think that exists here. Um, but uh, there's, 
the uh, upfront costs that the company has to bear, and also the attrition rate that they're trying to manage. And we know that uh, as that improves, they see a direct uh, kind of positive in terms of how that bolsters their cash flow. But that is definitely something that investors have to monitor, you know, in ter- with this company as things go forward. Also, in terms of that uh, debt reduction um, and that and the high balance that we often see with these kind of leverage buyout deals when the companies go back onto the market. Um, but we have a couple minutes left here, and I do want to spend some time kind of looking at the outlook uh, for uh, the company and also for some of its services and how that will change with uh, some of the new technology the kind of do-it-yourself offerings that customers are adopting as well. Um, so, uh, for ADT, I think the biggest question, uh, at least for the residential side of its business, is whether or not the company will be able to uh, to really compete as these uh, do-it-yourself alternatives become more and more popular. And you also have all these uh, new smart home devices that can offer similar monitoring and protection services that could arguably make what ADT offers redundant. I'm curious what you think about the the prospects for this company going forward in that regard. Right. So, um, interestingly enough, uh, Ring is such a great example of a small company, do-it-yourself company, which Amazon just acquired. That was one of the announcements in the last few weeks that pushed ADT stock down. And I would look at it as a, a, a real competitive threat. But interestingly enough, uh, ADT's executive team actually likes this whole progression because they have a lock on the traditional home security market. And what they see is smaller companies or companies that may team up with an Amazon will develop younger millennials who are interested in the do-it-yourself technology. And um, on the company's earnings conference call last month, the CEO, Tim Wall, described how these are often renters and ADT sees this as a progression where you do your own security yourself in your small apartment, but when you're ready to move into a home, you need a better system. And they see themselves as a company that can merge up and partner up with uh, companies that grab these millennials. And it's a long-term benefit uh, in ADT's eyes. Now, I don't know if, if that is actually how this will all pan out. It's a really fast-growing market. And Vince, you mentioned this sort of digitally connected market, which is yet another uh, subset of the home industry, home security industry, that is the so-called smart home powered by the Internet of Things, that subset is growing at a compounded annual growth rate of 17% a year. So it's doubling uh, nearly every five years. And ADT is just a little bit late to the game. As you mentioned, they've made some small acquisitions Mm -hmm. to play in this space. It's open yet to see whether they will eventually benefit by scooping up companies and or partnering with them uh, as customers buy these new technologies, or if they'll lose out. And with that high fixed cost base, if they are destined to sort of this low single digit uh, growth rate and a high debt burden, which is still going to take some years to pay off. Absolutely. And as as promising as it is, I think, to see uh, ADT embracing some of these collaborations, some of these partnerships with both the big tech companies like Google and Amazon, but also, I, I, I kind of question whether that competitive dynamic will prove to be a long-term tailwind um, in terms of attracting those younger consumers. I definitely think it's a possibility, and again, we'll kind of have to w- see how things bear out. But the effort, I think, that's required for a residential, uh, for a renter, for example, to self-monitor a do-it-yourself system. Um, th- the various motion detectors and sensors that you can install now in your own uh, apartment or your home, they will send a pop-up notification through to your phone with something's detected compared to the ADT system where they have the 24-7 monitoring. They have those 12 dedicated monitoring centers in uh, those monitoring centers in North America. But does it make up for essentially the added cost of what is essentially a middleman here between the resident knowing that some things might be wrong in terms of a smoke detector going off or an intruder on their property and then contacting emergency services. And the company also mentions that they have a real focus right now on optimizing, for example, their customer service and offering a really 
good experience for customers and hoping that that will be kind of a differentiator uh, that will set them apart from some of these competitive threats in terms of the do uh, the do it yourself side of the business. Um, and I do agree with the overall premise, uh, the idea that the DIY market will help kind of increase the entire pool of customers and potentially lift the overall industry. And, and obviously, ADT will uh, have to adapt and find ways in terms of cal- collaborations, partnerships to get into that. Um, the other part, the the side of the business that I think actually sees a little bit more concrete strength is on the commercial side. Um, it looks a lot brighter to me, and that was a big part of the Protection One integration. Uh, and the big thing here is that large commercial customers usually offer lower attrition rates, a shorter payback period for them to kind of for the company to break even. And I think this explains why uh, a lot of the Acquisitions that they've made in 2017 and 2018 so far are these uh, bolt-on kind of tuck-in acquisitions that are intended to support that commercial side of the business and the opportunity that it presents. Um, so we've a couple more minutes here. Any final thoughts from you, Austin, in terms of people who might be looking at this company, kind of considering the downward slide in terms of the stock price and things like that? Uh, what they should be focused on? The good news is that the company's um, enterprise value to EBITDA, which we talk a lot about on this show. Uh, enterprise value being your stock market capitalization plus your debt uh, divided by your earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. That number is around seven times. So, not not a bad or, or, or pricey stock. <laughs> That's the flip side of a steep descent since its IPO. Mm-hmm. Be cautious, investors. I would watch that balance sheet over the next couple of quarters. My last thought is I, I want to expand a little bit on something Vince mentioned. That commercial side does have some promise for this company. One of the reasons is that the bigger the uh, commercial enterprise, the more likely they are want they're going to want to put the equipment on their own books. Why that's important is because when ADT sells a system to me, uh, it sells it in such a way that it will own the equipment. It's forced to capitalize all those costs over uh, a two to three year period that corresponds with the, with the period Vince was mentioning that the equipment is paid off. So basically, the company can't expense that equipment all at once. Remember, it's not a manufacturer, it, it actually doesn't own it uh, yet. And these are all transactions that occur over the balance sheet. But as it goes more into commercial business, it will have a higher expense uh, on that equipment or companies that it's selling to will own the equipment. So, it'll have an even higher margin just selling its <clears throat> recurring monitoring services. And that could be powerful if the company can continue to acquire smaller concerns that uh, play in this commercial market. I do think that's a bright spot to keep your eye on over the next few quarters as you watch this. As we always advise with, with new IPOs, you don't have to jump in on day two. You can watch these for three to four quarters and then decide if you want to take a position or not. Yeah, and even if you think, if you see a lot of potential in this in the company and in the industry overall, um, we are beyond the the concerns that we always have in terms of uh, jumping into a recent IPO. He uh, definitely don't look at the recent slide as just this opportunity. Oh, it's a bargain jump in to jump in. You know, there's always the potential, of course, for it to go even lower. So, uh, definitely one. Th- uh, that's interesting to watch given its position in the industry, its leadership position. Um, but give, uh, also, with, in terms of some of those competitive dynamics, uh, it's, it's something that I'm sure we'll touch base on uh, towards the latter half of this year. Thanks, Asif, for joining us. Thanks very much. Thanks, Fools, for listening. Uh, people in the program may own companies discussed in the show, and the Molly Fool may have formal recommendations for or against any stocks mentioned. So don't buy or sell anything based only on what you hear during the program. Fool on. Mm-hmm.